to set this up. Hello? Hello? Okay, perfect. So, okay, this is a look. Do you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so this is a look at the modern WordPress server stack. Uh, as Chris introduced me, I'm Carl Alexander. Uh, I've been organizing uh, work camps in Montreal for almost uh, half a decade now. Um, and I also organize the meetups. Um, I've been doing WordPress since 2009. Uh, and I've been developing or coding since I'm in basically second grade. So a long time. You can find me on TwigPress uh, on Twitter. I also write on carlalexander.ca. Um, I love writing, I love technical writing, and usually this is the result. Uh, and I've tried very hard to, to get better at getting everybody to understand uh, what I'm trying to teach. And one of the things that I do when I'm speaking is I always write a companion article for the talk. So there's a 5,000 word companion article that's gonna go up tomorrow uh, around this. And there's also gonna be question breaks uh, throughout the talk, that way if you're, you feel that you're falling behind, you can ask me a question. So story time. Do you guys remember when a fast WordPress server was the good old LAMP stack? So Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Those were kind of the good old days. You didn't have to think too much. You could install MAMP and you knew that your server was going to have basically LAMP, which is just replace the Mac with Linux. And things were simpler. And nowadays, you need everything to load fast. You know, Google's gonna dock you. If, you, if your site takes too long to load, they'll, they'll dock you. You can lose some page ranks. Um, these consequences have, they're dire. Like, as a business, if you're, if you're selling anything, uh, if, if, you, if your site takes too long to load, those are bounces. There are people that you're losing. There are sales that you're losing. There are conversions that you're losing. It's super, super important to have a website that's fast. And because of that, the WordPress stack had to kind of evolve. So what does it look like? Um, this is kind of a conceptual overview of what the modern WordPress uh, stack looks like. And we're going to be going through that uh, throughout the talk. So the first kind of component or, or let's say section that, I, that we're going to talk about is what I call the request response cycle. Uh, it covers this section of, of the, the diagram. And really what it comes down to is the back and forth between uh, what you call an HTTP request. So it's, a, it's your browser uh, asking for something out of the web server. And the web server is saying, oh, okay, I might have that, here's, here's a response, and here's what, I, here's what I'm sending back. And the way it works is, whenever you're asking for, let's say, the Word, your WordPress homepage, the first uh, document, as they call it, that you're gonna get back to a response, barring that you get an error redirect and all those things, is always gonna be the HTML. So good old HTML that you do view source. This is what you're always gonna get first because inside that HTML, the browser also gets follow-up HTTP requests. Uh, for additional content, such as JavaScript, CSS, uh, movies, what have you. Uh, and those are always secondary. So the first is always HTML, and then after that, it's always the extra files. And your browser is going to continue to uh, cycle through the, this process of asking for uh, documents for either CSS file, JavaScript, and getting those back. And it'll continue doing that until it can render the page for you. So the real, the real trick is you want that to happen. The faster this happens, the faster your, your web page will appear to load because that's when really the loading process is when your browser says, okay, I have enough information, I can show you the web page now. So the faster this happens, the better it is. So that's, what, that's the first kind of optimization that we need to do. And the reason that we need to optimize that is because we can't just make a web server faster. Um, a web server is really a dispatcher, so it's, it, receives the, it receives the request, but really behind the scene, it's doing a whole bunch of other things. And one of them is for uh, your request to other services, like PHP, which runs WordPress. And really the trick to speeding up this, this uh, no, okay, perfect. Oh, this, is, this sounds actually a lot better. <laughs> uh, so really the trick at this point is really 
we want to receive as few requests uh, from the browser as possible, and we really want to forward as few of them as possible also to PHP, because PHP is really the slow, slow, slow part of, of this uh, whole stack. So what's involved in the first half uh, of this stack? Well, we have the web server, which is right here. So we have our browser. Our browser sends a request to the web server. And nowadays, there's three really big players in the web server space, and they own like 90% of the market share. So you have uh, Apache, which is the, the old guard, uh, still used widely, um, very well documented. You also have IIS, which is the Microsoft uh, web server, which I don't know who here has, uh, <laughs> you can also ignore that one, but who here has ever installed WordPress on IIS? Yeah, uh, that's like, that's not, you don't, you don't give that gift to any friends that you like. It's, it's really, it's not that fun. And then you have Nginx, which I, I'll call the new kid, but new kid's kind of rel relative because it's still over a decade old. But uh, it's used by Automatic since 2008. Uh, it's used by all the top uh, hosting, agent, hosting companies, uh, WP Engine, GoDaddy, you name it, they all use it. Um, and it's also used by a lot of the IN uh, agencies. So you'll, you'll hear 10up talk about it, you'll hear Web Dev Studios uh, hand, uh, talk about it. Um, it's built to handle a lot of traffic. So it was built by a Russian guy that I forget his name, but he worked for a really big site called Rambler, I believe. Um, in Russia, and he needed a web server that could handle a lot of traffic. So that's why it's really, really popular. But if there's one thing that you should remember from this talk, it's what we call HTTP cache or HTTP caching. Um, so we're, we're at this point now. So a request has gone to the web server, and now it's talking to what we'll call the HTTP cache, and it'll ask it, okay, have I had this request before? Uh, yes, no, and do I have something, a response cached already? So do I need to, to proceed any further with this? If the answer is uh, yes, I have something cached, then we can just return that to the web server, who then sends it back to the browser, which is excellent. And like I said, this is the most important element of, a, of the stack because by default, a web server is kind of dumb. Um, it'll always forward your request to PHP, uh, and PHP is often going to just generate the same response, which is absolutely terrible. Uh, because, like I said before, uh, the PHP is our bottleneck, and the HTTP cache solves this problem. It caches responses from PHP, and it really causes drastic uh, reductions in the cycle time. So it's really going to take your requests and throw out responses right away. And that'll, that'll save a lot of time. It'll make your site load a lot faster. And the good news, it's also the one, the solution, the component with the largest set of options for you to use. So the easiest one is to install what, we, what everybody knows as a page caching plugin. Um, here are all the five biggest ones that are available right now. So you have Backcache, Hypercache, WP Rocket, WP Supercache, and WP3, uh, W3 Total Cache. Um, in general, all four of them, the one that's not highlighted is the only, the one highlighted is the paid one, so WP Rocket. Uh, personally, it's the one that I like best as well. I find that for less technical people, it's the easiest one to use. Uh, but if you're looking for a free option, those other four are also super good. Then you have the middle option, which is you can have web, a web server uh, can actually do uh, HTTP caching as well. Um, this is a common uh, tutorial uh, for, for Nginx. Uh, I see that tutorial come over uh, very often. Uh, Nginx has something called fast CGI caching. Um, it's basically, instead of sending things to PHP, it'll check if it already rendered uh, the page and it'll return that instead. So that's a lot faster than uh, plugins because you're not hitting PHP. So before the plugin would still hit PHP, so there's still an overhead uh, to connecting for, for the web server to go to the PHP, but by having the web server do it, 
you're skipping this entire step and you're going to get a lot, a lot more uh, power out of it. Like, just with this simple middle option, you can s easily survive being slash dotted or being on the front page of Reddit because it, with Nginx or even Apache supports it, um, it's meant to handle a lot, a lot of traffic. And then the hardest option is Varnish. Varnish is a specialized uh, server appliance that is, its only purpose is to handle HTTP caching. So a lot of the top hosting companies use it. So WP Engine, um, to name, well, that one's the most known one because they have their Mercury um, local environment, which they use it with. But um, a lot of the top hosting agencies use that because they can extract that away from the web server and have a de dedicated uh, option for handling caching. I don't know if there's any questions so far. Yes. That is an excellent question, and it was cut out of this, but you'll find it in the article. Um, I've actually gonna, I've actually discussed the architecture of all three options, where they fit in, in the entire stack, because you are correct, they don't fit in the same uh, spot, if you will, because like I said, the plugin handles on the PHP side, meanwhile the web server is uh, by itself uh, handling it internally, and Varnish is a separate uh, appliance that the web server has to connect to. So they, they look different, but uh, just for, for length purposes, I had to cut that out. Uh, a CDN? Uh, it depends on the CDN. The, the really, the goal of a CDN per se is a global distribution. So let's say that you have an image in, um, you have a user in India who's trying to access an image. If it was hosted in New York, it would take them a lot of time to uh, load that image. So the idea is they distribute the image throughout the world so it's easier for them to uh, get access to it. But if I take, for example, S3, you have to manage what we call the caching headers yourself when you're uploading the, the images. Um, and really, that's what's going to do a lot of the, the work for you is the caching headers. Uh, any other questions? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. So the question is, how does the hardware uh, fit in all this? Um, it, it doesn't really change that much at this point. I mean, if you want to hone uh, bare metal um, server appliances, you can, but I find that DigitalOcean and really offer like pretty much the same thing at this point, and it's really hard to see the difference. Uh, another question? All right, well, I'll continue. Uh, the next step is what we'll call optimizing PHP. So at this point, we've gone through the web server, we've gone through the HTTP cache, it said, no, I don't have anything to return back. So now we have to uh, we have to go back and talk to, P to WordPress. So it's time for WordPress to do its thing and turn our request into a response. But at this point, we've hit what we our main bottleneck, which is PHP. So how can you optimize PHP to run faster to get your response out faster? Um, the easiest one is obviously use the latest PHP version. So right now the WordPress uh, minimum requirement is uh, 5.2, which is almost 10 years old. 10 years old. Uh, it has no more support since 2011, but the PHP team hasn't been quite uh, idle during that time. There's been a lot of improvement. In the PHP 5 uh, line of, of uh, versions, the really the biggest improvement was between 5.3 and 5.4, which you saw, I believe, 10 to 15 percent improvement in in uh, processing time. Um, the other thing that you can use is what we call opcode caching. So, the way PHP works is whenever you load WordPress, you're actually running a script like a Bash script, and PHP is just processing this script every time. And when it processes it, it's actually compiling it into what they call opcode, which is 
uh, basically a in between uh, between machine code and and just your PHP code, and it needs to do that every time, and it's very time consuming. So the opcode caching uh, compile caches this compile code so that it doesn't need to compile it every every time. Now, this is unbundled with uh, PHP. Uh, in 5.2, 5.3, or 5.4, but since 5.5, it's come built in. So that's another improvement gain that you can get just by moving ahead uh, in the PHP versions. And then the last one that I'm going to talk about is what I'm, I'm labeling next generation PHP, which is just two new PHP compilers. So you have HHVM, which has been talked about quite a bit uh, in the community, and the new uh, PHP 7. So both these compilers have been rewritten from the ground up. So they're not the PHP compiler that you would use before with, uh, with PHP 5. They're completely different. They use two different uh, architecture, uh, compiling architectures. So HHVM uses just-in-time compiling, and uh, PHP 7 uses ahead-of-time compiling. Both these compilers offer drastic, incredible, they're almost magical uh, performance gains. Um, and the good news is that WordPress supports those two compilers at 100%. There's no problem with those. The bad news is that not all the plugins or teams do. And really, that's kind of the problem with a lot of these uh, modern software, software server, uh, server stats is that they always need a fallback to PHP 5 in case there's an error. But having used them quite a bit, it's really, it's getting pretty much uh, stable at this point. So this is a, the next question period. I don't know if there's any other questions on this section. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you about the issues with HHVM. So in terms of code, um, the only issue that I've come across is with a plugin, uh, the fail to ban plugin, which sends uh, logs to syslog. And, and basically, for some reason, there's a bug there. We, I couldn't trace it. I couldn't find any ticket uh, on the GitHub about it. And really, you can kind of hack the plugin a bit and, and make it behave properly, but that's really the only bug that I've really found with it. But the big thing, I think, with HHVM, that if, if you're not a sysadmin or not somebody that's paying attention, is that HHVM kind of fails ca catastrophically when it, when it dies. Like, it, it just kind of, the, the service just stops, and it's really, really important to have that fallback that I mentioned before, because again, you don't want your, your website to, uh, to fail when that happens. And that's why a lot of the, the stacks that you see uh, posted on the internet, like WP Engine's uh, uh, Mercury, is that they always have a fallback to PHP 5, just in case that happens. But uh, if I'm, I'm going to get a bit in the, the nitty gritty, but if, you, if you're a sysadmin, you can install Monit. They'll restart the HHVM. But really, once it's configured well, it's fine. It's just the memory, it's really memory that kind of screws up with uh, HHVM. So if you use, if you're trying to run a, a web server on you know, in, uh, HHVM on not a lot of RAM, you have to be very careful because if, if it runs out of memory, it'll just die and leave you hanging. So that's, yeah. Um, I couldn't get, I've been playing around actually to, to build a local dev environment with, with such a stack and I had a lot of trouble with xdebug with HHVM. Um, it's supposed to work, but I think it might just be getting it to work within a, a VM that, that's kind of problematic. So at that, for, those, for those aspects of local dev um, environment construction, I'm not as familiar because I'm still kind of experimenting and, and researching around it. But my first kind of foray into it was that, yeah, it didn't work very well. But I think xdebug and PHP 7, though, works fine. Um, I just haven't had the chance to test it heavily because it's only going to be available officially in the Linux distribution uh, with Xenial that comes out in 
next week or just came out, but it's coming out soon. So it's not officially, PHP 7 is, is so new that it's not officially supported in, uh, by most Linux distributions yet, but uh, it's gonna be. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry, HHVMN? Like which one? Oh, CentOS, CentOS. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't tried it. Honestly, uh, recently I just migrated somebody away from CentOS because, I mean, that's another debate uh, entirely that I'm not gonna, I, that doesn't make quite sense here, but, but there's, there's reasons for it that uh, you can come talk to me after and we can discuss it. Any other questions? All right, so the last, the last kind of third aspect of, uh, of the stack is what I call the query results. So this is really the relationship between WordPress and the database. So what's going on between the, the two? Because by default, PHP files don't connect, contain any data. WordPress stores it all in MySQL databases. So really what it comes down to is WordPress or really PHP running the WordPress script is gonna hit uh, points where it's like, oh, I need to query my data source. I need to know what, what's in uh, my, my database server and get the result back so that I can continue on my way and, and continue loading my homepage. And this can happen a few dozen times to a few hundred times, but really if you're in the few hundred times uh, category, you should probably talk to your developer uh, or somebody else because that's a lot of requests um, and it, it's very time consuming. So optimizing this uh, aspect of the, the, the cycle comes down to the fact that database queries take time. Um, I don't know who here uses Query Monitor. Yeah, uh, I, like usually if you can, with Query Monitor you can see how long your queries take and sometimes a query can take as long as a couple of seconds. So that's a couple of seconds that your browser is actually waiting on the other end to get a response back. And, it can, and the worst part is that this is happening when, uh, like I mentioned initially, the first response that we'll always get back is your HTML content. And what's gonna generate the HTML content net need is PHP, which needs the database queries. So everything's gonna be blocked. So the longer your queries take, the slower, the, it slows down PHP's execution time, which slows down how long it takes for, your, for, infra, for the response to get back to your browser before it can even request everything else. So it, it has to wait for that to get the JavaScript files, to get your images, to get your CSS. And one of the problems that you have as, uh, as somebody managing a server is you don't always have control on how many queries are gonna be sent. Um, so really, even if we need to make PHP uh, wait as little possible, so really the goal here is to make PHP wait as little as possible. So even if we don't have access to the number of queries or reducing the number of queries that we're doing, like the goal should always be, we need to make this be as fast as possible. So what's involved in this stack, in this cycle? We have the database server. So we're gonna skip all the way to the end. And back in the day, MySQL database meant MySQL server. Unfortunately, the Oracle decided to take over uh, MySQL server and a lot of people weren't happy with that and the result is now we have multiple forked versions of MySQL. Um, but really there's no performance differences between the two. So really if you're using MySQL, you're fine. If you're using MariaDB, you're fine. If you're using Percona, that's fine. Uh, really what it comes down to is what we call storage engines. So who here has ever heard of MySM? and EnoDB, yeah. So those are storage engines. So they control how the database is gonna store data. And that has a much larger impact on um, 
on the speed of your database. By default, WordPress uh, installs MyXAM, um, which is really, if you're running like me, you're running a small site, that's, there's really not a lot of problems with MyXAM. It's, the performance is, is really good, but the, as you scale, um, the better choice is to use EnoDB. Um, because it performs better, especially on, on the, like, it doesn't do what we call a table lock whenever you're writing. So um, if you're, let's say, a common example is, let's say you're managing a site with a lot of publications. Every time that somebody's auto-saving a post, it would lock the, the database. So that's kind of, that would, that can cause slowdowns. But in general, that's not super important because what's important is what we call object cache. So who here is familiar with object cache? Okay, not too many people. Uh, the object cache is really a system that WordPress designed for storing uh, fetched but also generated data. It's really like, let's say you're, you're doing something that's heavy uh, processing wise. Let's say you want to cache an external RSS feed that you've processed. Um, you can use it as well. And WordPress uses this a lot um, because what it does is that it, let's say you, you you get an option from the database. Let's say you want to know what's my home URL. And maybe five, five plugins are going to ask what, uh, what the home URL is. You don't want, WordPress doesn't want to query uh, the, its database each time to know what the home URL is. So instead, it caches this um, inside the object cache. And this causes less database queries. So. Um, instead of having five requests for a uh, home URL, you just have one. And then it just keeps getting that information from the object cache. But the problem with the object cache is by default, uh, it's not persistent. So by this, I mean that let's say I'm requesting the home page of my blog, and I'm asking for a home URL five times. It'll, it'll go in the object cache, get requested once. But then let's say somebody else comes hits my home page, well, it still needs to do that one query again, except my home URL has never changed. Uh, because that type of data can stay valid for a super long time. Like, your home URLs technically will never change, unless you're really, the only time I can think of is if you're migrating, for example, HTTP, HTTPS, or something like that. So that's really when using a persistent object cache is really useful because what it does is it connects the object cache to what we call a persistent data store, um, which is uh, an appliance, also kind of like a database, that will store that data for future use. So each subsequent page load, instead of requesting the database for a home URL, is going to ask that data store, hey, do you have the U home URL? Well, yes, I already have it. So, and then that will save also time by not querying the database, which is the really, really heavy. And there are two popular data store options. Um, one is memcache. So memcache is what I call the old favorite. Uh, it's still used quite a bit. Uh, all of uh, WordPress.com uses memcache, um, a combination of memcache and batcache. Um, it's, it's still very, very performant. If you've invested time in memcache, it's not uh, wasted um, because it still performs super, super well. But really, the, the new hotness is uh, Redis, which is also a, a data store, but it does a lot more than just that, and it's super easy to set up. It doesn't need, um, you can actually use it without installing uh, additional drivers for PHP, and it'll it'll connect right away. But with those uh, two data stores, what you need, you also need a plugin. Because like, a, like I mentioned initially, the object cache itself is WordPress code. So what you need, you also need a plugin to go and uh, act as the intermediary between this persistent data cache and the object cache itself. So there's, there's a memcache plugin that's still very active, and there's a Redis plugin as well that's very active. The last thing I want to talk about is how can you do this uh, yourself? 
So I've done some research to find three kind of do-it-yourself options. Um, there's DevOps for WordPress, which is the project that I'm working on uh, that I started last year. It's my way of trying to uh, shore up the, the sysadmin for the community by providing a, re, a easy to deploy stack that's similar to WP Engine and man, uh, GoDaddy Managed and all those uh, big um, hosting providers. It comes with, currently it comes with HHVM, uh, MariaDB, Nginx, Redis, and Varnish. And it all comes pre-configured, pre -configured, so usually you just run two command lines and your site's gonna be good to go. The other extremely popular option is Easy Engine. I don't know anybody here that knows Easy Engine? Okay, a few people. Uh, Easy Engine, uh, they run a site, a super good site. Uh, if you're looking for sysadmin kind of tutorials, they, they have excellent tutorials. And they run, they have a project called Easy Engine that is a command line to install, uh, to configure a WordPress server with various, they, they're super flexible, so that's why most of the, my, my points are various. Uh, they always come with MariaDB, they always come with Nginx, uh, but you have various object cache options. Uh, they support memcache, they support Redis. They also support various uh, HTTP cache options, so they support um, just having a plugin do it. Um, they support having Nginx do it. They support having Nginx do it with Redis. Um, and they also have various PHP options as well. So if you want to try HHVM, they support HHVM. They also support PHP 7, and I believe that their normal PHP is 5.6, but uh, I can't remember offhand. And the last one is Trellis. Uh, Trellis is made by the Roots team. Uh, it comes with Mar MariaDB, Memcache, Nginx, uh, you can also have Nginx do the HTTP cache if you want, and PHP 7. The only uh, caveat with uh, Trellis is, uh, who here knows about Bedrock? Yeah, so it's, it's coupled with the Bedrock project. So Bedrock is uh, the Roots team kind of project framework for, for building uh, WordPress applications. Uh, we're using the 12-factor the app uh, philosophy, but the, their project is tied to having a bedrock project. So you can't use Trellis without your project being uh, using bedrock. At least that's what I, if somebody from the Roots team is here and wants to correct me, then perfect, but I couldn't find anything on their uh, discourse uh, board. So that's it. Whoop. I don't know if there was any other questions on that section or on the presentation overall. Yes? Sorry, uh, cache and validation and? Uh, I'm not familiar with the WP Engine cache and validation. As for the, for cache and validation with uh, Varnish, um, what you want to use with Varnish is uh, Bluehost has this uh, plugin uh, called Varnish Purge. So what it'll do is it'll communicate with Varnish whenever you update a post, and it'll it'll uh, send purge requests. So so without getting too into it, but uh, Varnish responds to a specific type of HTTP request that says I don't want this to be cached anymore. And what the plugin will do is whenever you update a post, it'll uh, it will send that request for every archive page, every RSS feed, and the home page that uh, this connects to. The only thing, um, having worked with it, uh, the only thing I have to mention is, let's say you're doing this yourself with Varnish, um, the purge all, there's a purge all for purging the entire site at the top of the, of the page, and that's really custom. So you have to go look at their Varnish configuration and see how they do it because instead of a purge, it's what Varnish calls a ban, which is like a, a more global kind of, let all these objects are now invalid. Yes? Uh, yes, um, not super recently, but when I was working on DevOps, 
Um, I was, I, the whole point of my, my project was that it needs to run on the smallest digital ocean droplet, so 512 megs of RAM. And using that, it could, if you're hitting varnish, you can easily send it hundreds of requests a second on that small of a server, and it'll handle it well. Obviously, if you start hitting PHP itself, even with HHVM, your mileage is going to vary because um, if your cache is cold, like the, the op cache, if it's cold or, or not, uh, will have a certain effect on it. But in general, it handles stress tests very, very well. Um, even out of the box, you can handle a lot, a lot of connections. Any other questions? Cool, sweet. So just a reminder, uh, I'll post the article uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's some extra information in there that I cut just for, for length purposes, uh, like HTTP2 and fast CGI. And like I was asked earlier, like what, what the different um, architectures look for, let's say you're using a plugin, a caching plugin, or versus Varnish versus uh, your web server. So thank you.